Lori Soderland is the author of two memoirs, The Change, My Great American Post-Industrial Midlife Crisis Tour, and Chasing Montana, A Love Story. She is a professor and the director of the MFA Creative Writing Program at Manhattanville College. Her work has appeared widely in anthologies and journals. Her essay, 66 Signs, is included in the Norton Anthology of Best Creative Nonfiction. She holds an MFA from Columbia University and is a reviewer for the New York Times. I first met Lori when we were both MFA students at Columbia University in the mid 90s. It was clear even then how talented she was. Everything she writes is compelling, whether it's a review of Sigrid Unida's novel, The Friend, a review of the newest collection of essays by Luke Sant, her essay, 66 Signs in the Norton Anthology, or her own memoir with its fascinating detail about the industrial ruins of the Midwest. Soderlund's sharp wit and clear prose draw the reader in. As Publishers Weekly writes, with a sharp eye for detail, Soderlund satisfies with a charm of her own. Lucy Jane Bloodsoe writes, quote, every good story is about longing and Soderlund's The Change plunges into that aching universe from the first page. In pursuit of her own lost heart, she sets out on a road trip and along the way, beguiling obstacles and complications are tossed in her path, making this a funny and smart story of two midlife crises, the countries and the authors. Her talent as a writer is equaled by her dedication as a literary citizen. Soderlund is a tireless supporter of both established and emerging writers, as you can see in all of her events at the Manhattanville MFA program. She is, a she is beloved in the literary community of the Hudson Valley and beyond. Please help me welcome Lori Soderlund. Jennifer, thank you so much for that. That was really, really, um a really kind uh, introduction, thank you. And, and I, wanna, I wanna thank you so much for all of your efforts uh, to pull together this reading, which is really special to me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And I also just wanna thank you for all the work you do through Hudson Valley Writers Center. It's so important to the literary community in the Westchester County area, and now the whole world, because I happen to know somebody in the UK is here. She said hello to me in the chat, so. Global reach, Jennifer, well done. Um, I'm gonna read from my, my new memoir, The Change, but I, I'm gonna put it into some context by talking about it a little bit first. Um, and I wanna say that uh, reading with Carolyn Porche is a real um, privilege to me and an honor, um, especially because of the way I think it sort of, dub her work a little bit inspires and dovetails a little bit with what I try to do in my work. Um, it is a real privilege for me to be here reading with Carolyn Perche because she's the kind of writer that I hope my work is maturing to, to be like. I admire her work so much. Of course, she's known as a poetry of, uh, she's known for the expression poetry of witness. Uh, she's the poet whose life summoned her to some dreadful and desperate places uh, so that we all might see what was happening there. She was the eyes for us all in El Salvador and later elsewhere. Um, so very humbly, I'll say that that in a way, this is what my own book, The Change, is attempting to do. Um, only what I set out to see is, um, and, I, and I set out about seven and a half years ago to see this, was dread and desperation in our own country, um, which in a funny way, I find Americans have been even more resistant to look at than they have been resistant to seeing struggles elsewhere in the world. And I think this is because it's kind of like doing self-reflection. Um, and it's safer to look at the troubles of others, but when we start looking at ourselves, we become uncomfortable. We're looking at our own country has been uncomfortable. Um, and I'll add to that, um, that in my opinion, the divide in this country that tries to make others of us is a purely political construction. Um, as I see it, we are one country, we are one broken country, 
Um, and we can't be fooled into thinking that we have some unbreachable divide between an us and a them. It's, it's all us as far as I see it. Um, but in any case, um, it all becomes with it all it all begins any kind of healing begins with a willingness to look and that's what I tried to do in my book. Um, seven, seven years ago when I took this journey. So the context for the journey is that I set out on a drive with my very old dog Colby um, in 2013 and we were pulling a 13 foot trailer called a scamp and I'm going to share my screen for just a second to show you what my scamp looked like. Um, I have a picture that you should be able to see is my Toyota hooked up to a 13 foot long trailer called a scamp, which was approximately large enough for one smallish human being and um, one smallish dog. Um, and I set out to see what I refer to as the most depressed ruins and godforsaken places I could find and to hang out there and to get to know those places. And the thing is, I didn't have any basic understanding of the industrialization of this country, much less for this post-industrial present that we're in with all these destroyed factories and loss of manufacturing jobs. I had no context for that. I didn't know anything about that. All I knew was that when I drove around the country, I'd see all these towns and cities that uh, they all seem to have shot up in a big rush in the 18th century, um, or really the 19th century, I should say, the 19th century. And they, they all shot up with all this enthusiasm, this Western drive, this, this excitement. And, and now they're all so wrecked and abandoned. Uh, and, or maybe they're just crushed by late 20th century sprawl. Um, but in any case, um, the people where I'm from on the East Coast of this country act like all that stuff was just some sort of mistake and they don't understand why there even is a Cleveland, much less why anybody wants to live there. Um, and that's interesting to me. It's like, well, but why is it all there and how did it get there? So the full title of my book is The Change My Great American Post-Industrial Midlife Crisis Tour. Um, so. I'm having a midlife crisis seven years ago, turning 50 or nearly 50. And, um, and I came to see the whole country as sort of looking the way I felt. Um, uh, so I'm gonna read an excerpt from the change that I think tries to encapsulate both the way I'm, I'm bringing history into the story and trying to educate myself and maybe readers about what this industrial history of the country is and what this decline is that we're living through. Um, but also I, I pull in my personal narrative because I think personal narrative and humor are the only ways that you can convince people that they should learn that history. So hopefully the section that I'm reading is going to get a little bit of all of that. Um, and uh, so this is from the chapter on the Erie Canal. Uh, if you're uh, following along in your hymnals, it's page 26 is where I'm reading from. And I will... Uh, be about a 15 minute reading. I'm gonna jump around just a little bit. So, so Colby and I have, have camped for the very first night. We're in a marina campground in St. Johnsville, New York on the Erie Canal. The marina and campground were run by a guy named Bernie whose office was decorated in mounted fish and fish heads and photos of men holding up big fish they had caught. A pack of white haired men joined Bernie daily in the back room where they played low stakes poker and mocked each other for sport. There was a keep out sign over the door to the back room. It was like a tree fort for old guys. I've always enjoyed the company of old men, mainly for the reasons I like all kinds of older things, the stories they tell, the history in them, but also because so many have this habit of acting like big grumps and pretending it's funny. They get away with all kinds of bad behavior. Grumpy old age is a tool in the big box of flirting tools for men, one they can put to shameless use just when the box is looking pretty darn empty. But no, the box is never empty. There is no menopause. The old men of St. Johnsville were abundant, which is fun if you like flirting with old codgers, but is also a symptom of a dying place. Young people leave, old folks stay. They retire, their nests empty out. They live in their empty nests as long as they can. 
Then they sell the nest and buy a big, as big an RV as they can afford and head to Florida. In summer, they come home and they live at the marina. The old men playing cards or, longing, or lounging about their trailers had become living shades of the town itself, having been young and vital when the town was younger and more vital. St. Johnsville once had an opera house. It once had neat sidewalks and a place that built pianos and a shop that made cigars and pretty much a shop for everything else you might need. But by now there was only a dollar store and a pharmacy. Nearly everything else in St. Johnsville was gone and the old men were also nearly gone or on their way to leaving. The gas pumps in the center of town bustled, yes, but the diner across the way was no longer serving, ever. Empty storefronts were boarded up or decorated solely by faded bent signs that said, coming soon, and named things. But these things were more wishful than true and soon had meant soon a long time ago. The men at the marina recalled working at the beechnut plant fondly as if its loss had merely been inevitable, not tragic. They grew old, it grew old, we'll all die one day, all is already lost, deal the cards. But I had never really looked close enough to understand what was happening. These little towns we all called dumps, where I come from, were not dumps at all. They were old guys playing solitaire. They contained complex stories. I'm now skipping ahead to page 28 where I'm going to read a little bit about the Erie Canal. Here's the thing about the Erie Canal. It's not just a ditch. It was in its day an absolutely miraculous 363 mile long waterway that linked Albany to Buffalo and thus the Great Lakes with New York Harbor and thus frankly the Midwest, which was known simply as the West back in 1825 to Europe. It is also just about the least sexy historical interest one can cultivate second only to costumed military reenactments, including medieval jousting events. Not sexy, no. But bear in mind that many things become more appealing when given half a chance. People too. I used to wear clothes two sizes too large for my trim 30-year-old body, and I had gone through a series of unfortunate haircuts over the years, but these things could be seen past. Jessica saw the good in me when we met and took charge of my wardrobe and I was transformed. Likewise, I saw a nearly abandoned pre-industrial ditch and with a mere micro dose of historical knowledge, I understood this masterpiece to be one of the wonders of the world. It was not something I had ever taken seriously until I really looked and then I fell in love. The problem is we've sort of infantilized what sh we should understand as a primary driver of America's destiny. Look up the Erie Canal at any library and you will find yourself directed to the children's section. I think it's because of the song. Before my trip with Colby, pretty much my entire canal education consisted of memorizing the lyrics to the Erie Canal song, which I learned one afternoon in third grade. Thomas Allen wrote it in 1905. Pete Seeger sang it a lot, if that rings any bells. Here are the essential lyrics. I got a mule and her name is Sal, 15 years on the Erie Canal. She's a good old worker and a good old pal, 15 years on the Erie Canal. And you'll always know your neighbor and you'll always know your pal if you've ever navigated on the Erie Canal. The song and the fact that canal boats and mules look great in shoebox dioramas makes the canal ideal for third grade history lessons. But the, the mule fixation buries the staggering genius of the thing. It was dreamed up by men who studied the canals in Europe, then came back to New York and eyeballed the Mohawk Valley wilderness, then scratched their whiskers and said, well, why not? Just clearing 363 miles of vine choked forests for the towpaths was a feat in 1817 when they started. They didn't have cross cut saws, much less, much less chainsaws. They used axes. They pulled whole trees up from the ground, roots and all. This makes my knees weak. It takes me nearly a full day to trim my forsythia bush with hand tools. I can't comprehend building a canal that way. Making this ditch was memorable enough, but that was just the start of the story. This singular achievement launched our country into its future. 
Before the canal, anything beyond the Allegheny Mountains was a wilderness. The Alleghenies are a long ridge from Pennsylvania down to Virginia. They are part of the Appalachian Range, or which I should say Appalachian Range, I, I know, um, which runs the length of the East Coast. We barely notice the Alleghenies anymore, but before 1825, they stood between the settled East Coast and everything else. The West, with, uh, the West with no functioning path across. Anyone who wanted to see Ohio before it was Ohio had to bushwhack. The most traveled route over the mountains was a dysfunctional muddy potholed mess called the National Road on the Pennsylvania Maryland border. The National Road is a thing I had never seen, never heard of before I took this trip, most certainly because it had no song attached to it. The whole American project was pinned down to the East Coast until the Erie Canal solved the problem. And then suddenly in 1825, a smooth passage was opened for business and the world changed. The summer before I left for my trip with Colby, after I came home from a week with my friends in Wisconsin, I decided to travel the canal by boat. Jessica and I could go to, to visit my family in Wisconsin in August, but we wanted some other more exciting summer adventure together. While the canal wasn't exactly like two weeks in Prague, it was certainly a venture to, to, into my state of mind, and Jessica gamely resolved to go there with me. The Erie Canal had for some time been trying to stage a comeback as a boater's paradise. It's more or less a desolate string of old dead factory towns, really. But brew pubs had been piping, popping up along it with decks facing the water, the same water along which barges had been dragged by mules and the mules were whipped by canal men and the canal men cursed and drank and spit into the dirt. There is today family fun to be found in all of this and a growing number of hotspots on the canal for history geek tourists and beer connoisseurs. Jessica and I decided we would try it. And I'll skip ahead just a little bit here to say that I'm, uh, we planned our trip, we were gonna do the whole length of the thing, but that's a pretty big undertaking. So ultimately my dream ride along the length of the Erie Canal got mashed into one day during which we would take a little motorboat up through two locks and back again. And even for this scaled back adventure, we were ill prepared and we got a very late start because we spent the morning drinking coffee at our fancy little inn up in the hills Still, we launched, and when we reached the gates of our first lock, I wasn't sure what to do. We couldn't seem to properly signal the lock keeper that we were waiting below to enter. Our tiny boat bobbed around in the strong current below the high cliff of this lock, trying not to crash into any rocks until eventually the lock keeper, lock keeper up above saw us. Then the enormous gates opened, but Jessica and I couldn't agree on a strategy to move through them into the stone chamber without being tossed around in the big waves and crashing into everything we passed. We argued as we fumbled in, and then we didn't know how to safely grab the ropes hanging from the old stone lock walls to keep us from thrashing around and slamming into those walls as the water rose. Jessica shouted at me. I shouted back that I was the skipper and shouting at me was forbidden. Then the steel gates slammed shut behind us with the resounding clap of mechanical thunder, a sound strikingly final, as if we had sent, been sentenced to die in a dark and watery dungeon. We stopped speaking to each other altogether. A near silence fell briefly around us and we looked up at the top of the lock in terror. Then water started cascading down the rough old walls and filling the chamber, and I saw the improbability of us surviving this project. I tried to maneuver the boat into some safe seeming position, but the rising water rocked us, tossed our pretty motorboat against the stones. In my memory, sheets of cascading water spun us in circles and flooded down heavy across our crying faces. And oh, how we cried, but the water drowned the echo of our screams, felt cold and mean and deadly and damn near sunk us as we spun out of control, heading for a drain, feeling ourselves sucked mercilessly into this massive and very deadly infrastructure that was no child's diorama after all. But of course that can't be right because the water does not pour in through the walls of the locks on the Erie Canal. It rises gently and gradually from below. And the real sound of it is not the sound of a waterfall but more like a deep hum and some splashing. 
Still, it seems like torrents. It felt like hell. Confusion and anger and a desperate and sad certainty told me that in this coffin-shaped stone aquarium designed for barges, not motorboats, Jessica and I would die. Our bodies would not be found. Perhaps many had died before us. Sitting in stony silence in that outsized cell, I could not think of one kind thing to say to the person who had loved me for years, if imperfectly, and so my mind began to revise our history, meaning mine and Jessica's, and also the long history and even the very existence of a place called the United States of America. It may have been a good idea once, but in hindsight, probably it had all been a cruel and often murderous mistake. Then at the top of the lock, another gate opened and let us out and it was a sunny day again. Eternal hope, we motored with renewed curiosity to the next lock the highest on the whole canal, the 40-foot Lock 17 at Little Falls, and we rose almost as awkwardly and unhappily as we had in the first lock, though a little less fearful now because we were experienced. A moderately less sullen silence suggested that Jess and I had reached a truce. At the top of the lock, the day was again still beautiful. We spat out into the long lane of water that just with just exactly enough time to dock in Little Falls and sprint to the antique store slash bakery in a quaintly renovated canal side neighborhood, one of several spots where tourism had indeed taken hold, spawning spiffy waterfront facades in an otherwise sad little town full of vacant buildings. Jessica and I each got a foam to go cup of watery coffee, then sprinted back to the boat and down to lock 17 in time to experience the heinous yet fascinating lock process in reverse, descending, and then half an hour later, we were very luckily allowed to pass back through the friendlier, smaller Lock 16, even though we had arrived there perilous, perilously close to 6 p.m. when the lock keeper goes home. And then finally, we returned to the marina dock and put the boat back on its trailer. We returned to our inn beside an 18th century mill on a roaring waterfall. And in the morning, my car battery died in a place where it was not possible for a tow truck to get through to jump it. I stopped speaking to Jessica altogether then as if this were her fault, but I don't blame her now. The canal exposed a discontent that I didn't want to think about, though it had been jarred loose in the beginning of the summer and had been uncomfortably close to the surface since then. It had been easier to ignore that before, it had been easier to ignore before that summer, but now I saw the failing of everything around me. Nothing worked. My body hurt in places I had not previously noticed. Jessica and I also did not work in a way that mattered to me. And at night at our millside inn near the canal, we drank wine until it was time to go to bed, still smarting from our battle for control, I suppose. We went to sleep on our far sides of the mattress and in isolation I had come to expect, I woke up thinking about discontent in America. And I think I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori, that was incredible. And thank you for sharing the photograph so we could get a better sense of exactly what was going on when you were on the road. So now I would like to introduce Carolyn Forche. Carolyn Forche is a poet, memoirist, translator, and editor. Her books of poetry include In the Lateness of the World, just out at the beginning of the pandemic, The Angel of History, the Country Between Us and Gathering the Tribes, which was selected for the Yale series of Younger Poets by Stanley Kunitz. Her memoir, What You Have Heard is True, a memoir of witness and resistance, was a finalist for the 2019 National Book Award in nonfiction. I first read The Colonel from the Country Between Us when I was in Michael Harper's poetry workshop in college. Soon after that, my mother sent me the angel of history and I kept it beside my bed while I was writing my senior poetry thesis. Once someone reads Carolyn Forche's work, they follow it forever. 
I'm sure we have fans of both her poetry and her memoir here today. Many of you have no doubt read either the memoir or at least one or two reviews of it. Sophia is going to put in the chat the information of how you can order it if you haven't already read it. As the New York Times review from March 2019 states, until the publication of this memoir, which takes its title from the first line of her famous poem, The Colonel, Forche's experiences in El Salvador, seven extended stays between 1978 and 1980, have mostly stayed distilled in her poetry. The Colonel begins with an elegant dinner at a Colonel's home, back of lamb, green mangoes, and ends with him emptying a grocery sack full of human ears onto the table, ghastly trophies from a dirty war. In her memoir, Forche writes, people think that what happens to someone else has nothing to do with them. They think that what happens in one place doesn't matter any place else. Our global pandemic that we're living through right now is reminding us every day that that is not true. Forche does an incredible job showing us how and why she came to travel to El Salvador. A 27-year-old poet, Forche tried to convince Gomez, the man who convinces her to make the trip, that a journalist should be the one to tell the story. The fact that he wanted a white American poet to be the witness and the scribe to the disappearances gets to the very heart of what poetry can do for humanity. When Elizabeth Powell interviewed Carolyn Forche for the Best American Poetry blog, she quoted Shelley's famous statement that, quote, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Powell states, it seems Gomez understood this, that having a poet's eye could help begin to bring peace and reconciliation to a place of deep violence. We are so grateful that Carolyn Forche went to El Salvador and that she wrote this memoir and we can learn from it. We're so grateful that she's here today to read from it and to talk to us about writing of witness and craft. Please help me welcome Carolyn Forche. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I so enjoyed your reading, Lori. I'm glad we're together here. Um, welcome everyone. Um, on this uh, wintry, for some of us, um, pandemic Sunday. Uh, it's one of the things that has been so heartening to me during this year has been being able to gather this way so often with so many people. I hope you'll stay safe and well throughout. Um, there are two epigraphs at the beginning of this book. This is the book, uh, What You Have Heard Is True. One is James Baldwin, for the strangest people in the world, are those people recognized beneath one's senses by one's soul, the people utterly indispensable for one's journey. And the second epigraph is Federico Garcia Lorca, and it is, nobody knows you, no, but I sing to you. And both of those epigraphs are for Leonel Gomez, Leonel Gomez is the uh, cousin of Claribel Alegría, a poet from Central America, born in Nicaragua and grew up in El Salvador. I met Claribel's daughter when I was teaching in San Diego, um, when I was in my mid twenties, we became fast friends and she persuaded me to translate her mother. In order to do that, I traveled to Spain to stay with her mother for a summer along with Maya and this summer began a process. I wasn't aware of it at the time, but it began an education that would never end for me. Uh, it, that summer it inspired me to want to do something. Um, I didn't know what yet, because all of the people who were gathering at Clarivel's house over the summer were people fleeing murderous military regimes in Chile, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay and Central America. Um, and so I would sit in a little circle at the edge of the circle, listening to their stories every afternoon. And when I got back to San Diego, Leonel Gomez, the cousin, had he had heard about me, had heard that I was translating 
his cousin's poetry, he and he decided to pay me a visit and to ask me to to make a journey. I guess both Lori and I have journey journey memoirs here um, today. And I'm going to begin with a harrowing scene that actually opens the book, but takes place quite a ways into the story. So I guess we give trigger warnings now. There's a little bit of um, difficulty in this scene. It's uh, uh, harsh. It is near the end now. We are walking in the rippling heat of a sorghum field. Cicadas whirring to an empty sky. A man uncorks a water gourd. Another man leans against a spade. There is a woman here too, wearing an aproned skirt over her trousers. Hard light and the dry rattle of sorghum seed heads. I'm holding a spray of seeds. One of the men takes Leonel aside and tells him something, a secret like everything else. We get into the Jeep and without explanation, drive to another place not far from this field. The campesinos, rural peasants, would have walked, measuring distance not in kilometers, but in hours or days. What are we looking for, I ask, and as always, he doesn't answer, swearing under his breath through the haze of smoke that hangs in the air where the corn had been growing. We stop near a cluster of champas, shacks made of mud and wattle. One of them has collapsed and smoke rises from it. Wait here, he tells me, but I don't wait. I had stopped waiting for him months before this, but he can't seem to break this habit of telling me to wait. Smoke is rolling like a shore cloud along the fields just above the blackened stubble. We walk and when he stops, I stop. And when he continues, I continue. He palms the air to say, slow down or be quiet. I slow down and am quiet. When we reach the champas, no one is in them. No one is home. A large plastic bowl used for making the slurry that becomes tortilla dough is overturned on the ground. There is a child's t-shirt in the tortilla slurry. Behind one of the chambas, it appears that several hens have been held by their feet and whacked against a stone. They are lying on the ground, one of them still opening and closing its beak. A hundred or so meters more, and we hear the whine of flies, the hissing and belching of turkey vultures, a flapping of wings like applause in the maize stalks as the fattened birds try to lift themselves. A flatbed truck follows at a distance behind us with three campesinos standing in the back. They are calling out to us or to the driver of the truck, but I don't understand what they say. I don't know what I had expected to see, but not the swollen torso of a man with one arm attached to him, a black pool of tar over his crotch. I didn't expect that his head would be by itself some distance away without eyes or lips. The stench in the air is familiar, a rotting, sweet, sickening smell, human death. I bend down when I see the head, but I hear Lionel saying, don't touch it, let the others do it. At first, I thought they were going to find the rest of the man and place his remains in the truck. But instead, they gather the arms and hands, the legs with their feet attached and bring them to the torso where it lies on the ground. They set the head on the neck where it once had been. Then the three men take off their straw hats and stand in a circle around the man they have reassembled. They stand and one crosses himself lightly The parts are not quite touching. There is soil between them, especially the head and the rest. Birds nearby hoping we will go away and leave them to this meal. The air hums, we walk. Why doesn't anyone do something? I think I asked. So um, 
of course, the doorbell rings. Um, I'm going to give you a little paragraph from that. Uh, over the years, I've asked myself, this is on the next page, what would have happened if I hadn't answered the door that morning, if I'd hidden until the stranger was gone? Knowing him as I came to know him, he would have sensed my presence and continued ringing the bell. On that day, I had been at my typewriter, a heavy IBM Selectric that a friend would later complain sounded like a machine gun. There were stacks of papers everywhere, human rights reports, students' essays and poems, unfinished manuscripts, unanswered correspondence. A sea wind passed through the screens, lifting some of these papers into the air and sailing them to the floor. The finches were singing atop their bamboo cage as its door was usually open, leaving them to fly about the house, perching on ceiling fixtures and open doors. In those days, I could type faster than I could think. My father saw to that when I told him I wanted to be a poet. I would need to be able to fall back on something, he'd said. Fall back from where, I had wondered to myself at the time. The typewriter was set on the kitchen table and most days I worked there. The ocean almost audible, the air scented by the fields of nearby flower farms. As it was late morning, the harvesters of Encinitas had already left for lunch, having begun their work at dawn. At first, I might not have noticed the sound of the van pulling into the driveway, but its engine remained idling, so it wasn't simply turning around. Then the engine died and the doors were opening. So Lionel spends three days with me and um, I'll, I'll, let, I'll leave that to the memoir. He, he persuades me to come to El Salvador because he says war is coming. At that time, El Salvador was supposed to be at peace. Um, so I had many, many experiences there especially in 1978, 79, and early 80. Most of the book takes place in those years, although there are little flashes to childhood and then there are uh, scenes that take place later. Um, so one of them is a uh, experience in prison. Uh, I went into a prison to try to uh, see the interior and make a report to a human rights organization. I Lionel had arranged this for me to go in, but he couldn't go with me. He arranged for me to have about 30 minutes inside this prison, and I would pretend to be visiting one of the prisoners there and pretend to have known him in the past. So he, his job is to show me around, and he does that. We turned a corner where a group of prison guards had gathered in a circle playing a game with dice. Thoroughly occupied with the game, tossing dice and laughing or groaning, no one looked at us. We had made almost a full circle of this courtyard on all four wings. Miguel glanced around cautiously. Listo, he whispered, are you ready? He locked eyes with me, then asked if I saw the dark open doorway nearby. I did. It was not quite 10 feet away, a room with an entrance like the barracks, like the workrooms, but it was on the other side of the courtyard, the far side. No one is paying attention to you now. Just walk into that room and try to see what you can. Don't stay long and control your face when you come out. I'll be right here. If anyone sees you and asks what you are doing, just make an absent-minded North American lady face. And he imitated such a face by looking at me blankly with his mouth slightly open. I had never seen anyone do that before, and I didn't realize that this is what we looked like to others. And just say that you got lost. For a moment, I froze, then he smiled and nodded yes to me, tossing his head in the direction of the doorway. Go now, quickly. I was inside the room. It was darker than any other room in the prison, and it stank more. Look at the world, he'd say, and not at the mirror.
I was inside the room. Yeah, I'm sorry, I got lost here. I tried to adjust my eyes to the darkness, tried to see Lionel had said it was what he was always asking me to do, try to see. What I saw were wooden boxes about the size of washing machines, maybe a little smaller. I counted the boxes, there were six, and they had small openings cut into the fronts where chicken wire mesh, with chicken wire mesh over the openings. They were padlocked. As I stood there, some of the boxes started to wobble a little, and I realized that there were men inside them. Fingers came through one of the mesh openings. Blood rushed to my ears and I stood trying to orient myself so I could know not only where the room was, but also which wall the boxes were against. And then I walked slowly toward the light of the open doorway and into the hall where Miguel was standing against his crutch. As I came toward him, he whispered, tie your sweater sleeves around your neck. You have hives. I get hives not as often as I once did, but in childhood frequently, whenever I was afraid or nervous or sad, they bloomed on my neck and face. So I did as he asked and tied the sweater sleeves. That's La Oscura, the darkness, solitary. Sometimes men are held in there for a year and can't move when they come out because of the atrophy of their muscles. Some of them never recover their minds tell them on the outside, tell them. And then raising his voice, he said, Catalina, it has been so nice to see you again. Give my love to Anna and Carlos. He was walking, whispering again, Mil gracias, it's time for you to go now. Go, he said, motioning with his head toward the gate. But will you be all right? Como no, he said, go. At the entrance, Lionel was waiting as promised. But beyond him, soldiers had surrounded his hiachi and were looking through the windows. He rested his hand on my shoulder and we began walking side by side. Why are they? I don't know. I guess we're going to find out. So um, there's another character in the book, Margarita. She becomes uh, my very good friend um, and she would take me to Lauca, which was the Catholic Jesuit University, where she worked some of the time. And that's where I got to know the Jesuit priests. Uh, they would be assassinated in later in uh, 1989 in November. But at this time, we were having conversations at Lauca. And some of the times in this book are very lighthearted. And this was one of those times, except that something happened when we, when we tried to leave. That evening, we'd planned to meet with some of Margarita's friends and a few European journalists who had arrived in the country several weeks earlier. We would listen to reports of what they had seen and we would tell them what we knew. There would be Coca-Cola and potato chips. We were still in the clothes we had chosen that morning. So yes, we did look bourgeois, but I would never have been able to run in those shoes. I could barely walk in them. Margarita pulled out of the parking lot onto what I would call a slip road, a narrow and unlit road that wound around Lauca. She was still laughing and teasing me when suddenly, and in a grave voice, she said my name and the car was flooded with light. She pressed the accelerator to the floor. The vehicle behind us was following so closely that a person could have leaped from one roof to the other. Margarita sped into a tunnel of darkness ahead and the vehicle behind us sped too. Escuadron de la Muerte, she said. It is the death squad, Carolyn. They are going to capture us. I turned around to watch the other car but couldn't see it for the light. Margarita, I remember calling out, can you go faster? No, Carolyn, I cannot. This is as fast as I can go and I think I'm lost. There's the city ahead of us, drive toward the lights. We sped, the other car sped too. This was going to be it, I thought. Now, when it wasn't expected, after a day of talking about philosophy and God and the practice of liberation, I wanted to be brave. I did not feel brave. 
I had no weapon, it would not have helped. There was no last chance to do anything over again. Are you afraid, Margarita? Yes. They were still behind us when we reached a heavier trafficked road, behind us when we got to the roundabout, and that was where the honking began. Other cars whose drivers saw what was happening, other cars pulling into the roundabout, slowing down, blocking the way of those who followed us, and all the while horns honking, and even some cars stopping, and people getting out of the cars. And then there was an opening and we took it all the way to the house of the friends of Margarita. We didn't breathe. And then the door was opening and we ran through it from the front of the house to the garden in the back where the journalists were standing around in the dark. Um, I think I'm going to just uh, end the, the memoir part with a little, uh, with a little, Part from a, a, a kind of a epilogue. It takes place years later, but it's we had just scattered Lionel's ashes on a mountain. Over the years, I've been asked why. As a 27 year old American poet who spoke Spanish brokenly and knew nothing about the Isthmus of the Americas, I would accept the invitation of a man I barely knew to spend time in a country on the verge of war. And why would this stranger, said to be a lone wolf, a communist, a CIA operative, a world-class marksman, and a small-time coffee farmer, take any interest in a naive North American poet? As one man put it, what does poetry have to do with anything? We reached the chosen place and opened the box. And before digging my hands into his remains, I asked him quietly within myself if I might tell the story now. Everything, or almost everything. Of course, he bellows, write, write, and do not waste time. Why do you think I brought you to Salvador in the first place? So you could eat papayas? You're a goddamn poet, Papu. You must write. People ask me now what it was like to work with him in the early days before the war. Some still want to know who he really was, of course, but that is now becoming apparent to friends and also to enemies, as he knew it might one day. This is what I tell people now. It was as if he had stood me squarely before the world, removed the blindfold, and ordered me to open my eyes. So that is uh, the passages from the memoir. And uh, at the request of the wonderful Hudson Valley writers, I'm going to read two poems to close um, because I have a new poetry book. It's in the lateness of the world. And uh, I took 17 years to pull this poetry book together. So no one feel badly if your book is slow in coming. Um, because it was 17 years since I did the last one. I'm going to read the first poem of the book and the last poem. And the first poem is called Museum of Stones. And it's about a friend who everywhere he went in the world, he took a little stone home with him and mounted it on a wall, beautifully labeled with where he had found the stone and when, and, and it was a museum of stones. These are your stones assembled in matchbox and tin, collected from roadside, culvert and viaduct, battlefield, threshing floor, basilica, abattoir. Stones loosened by tanks in the streets from a city whose earliest map was drawn in ink on linen. Schoolyard stones in the hand of a corpse. Pebble from Baudelaire's we. Stone of the mind within us carried from one silence to another. Stone of Cromlech and Cairn, schist and shale, horn blend agate marble, millstones, ruins of choirs and shipyards, chalk, marl, mudstone from temples and tombs. Stone from the silvery grass near the scaffold, stone from the tunnel lined with bones. Lava of a city's entombment, Stones chipped from lighthouse, cell wall, scriptorium. Paving stones from the hands of those who rose against the army. Stones where the bells had fallen, where the bridges were blown. 
those that had flown through windows, weighted petitions, feldspar, rose quartz, blue schist, knee and shirt. Fragments of an abbey at dusk, sandstone toe of a Buddha mortared at Bamiyan. Stone from the hill of three crosses and a crypt, from a chimney where storks cried like human children. Stones newly fallen from stars, a stillness of stones, a heart, altar and boundary stone, marker and vessel, first cast, load and hail. Bridge stones and others to pave and shut up with, stone apple, stone basil, beech berry, stone break. Concretion of the body, as blind, as cold, as deaf. All earth a quarry, all life a labor, stone-faced, stone drunk with hope that this assemblage of rubble taken together would become a shrine or holy place, an ossuary immovable and sacred, like the stone that marked the path of the sun as it entered the human dawn. And the last poem is, uh, and the last poem of the book is called What Comes. And it is about surviving cancer and for all people who survive cancer. And it begins with a little epigraph by René Chau, the French resistance poet. And his epigraph is, I brought back from despair a basket so light, my love, that it could have been woven of willows. To speak is not yet to have spoken the not yet of a white realm of nothing left, neither for itself nor another, a no longer already there, along with the arrival of what has been, light and the reverse of light, terror as walking blind along the breaking sea body in whom I lived, the not yet of death, darkening what it briefly illuminates. An unknown place as between languages, back and forth, breath to breath, as a calm in the surround rises, fireflies in lindens and ache of pine. You have yourself within you. You have her, and there is nothing that cannot be seen. Open then to the coming of what comes. Okay. That's it. Thank you so much, Carolyn. I had to turn my video off for a second because <laughs> I got flustered with crying from that last poem. Um, Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Lori. What a beautiful pairing, the, hearing the two of you read together. Um, it really was an honor to be able to host this reading. Thank you all for being here. We have a lot of questions and Sophia and I are going to take turns um, asking um, you. Um, I'll just quickly start while people are still writing in. Um, I was reading when I was working on your introduction um, in The Nation and it, the, the interview that you gave um, when your poetry book came out, you said that you wrote the memoir and the new book of poems simultaneously and they tug and lean on each other. Um, you said part of my soul went into my memoir and another part went into the poetry book. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit um, about that, especially for the people in the audience who, who write both poetry and memoir and, um, and how that, that worked writing them together. So oh, this is for me. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, I can't do them both at the same time. I, I think it's a, it's a different compositional um, experience. It requires a different consciousness. This was my first prose book. So I, I, and it took me 15 years to finish it. it. You know, I wrote a lot of versions of it. And so the poetry workbook was kind of waiting for the prose book to be done. And what I would say is that um, 
You have to hold the whole book in your mind when you're writing a prose book. And if you stop for a little while, you have to re-enter it again and write it through or read it through to place yourself back in that world and hold it all, all. And so you can't leave a prose book. It's dangerous to leave it. And with poetry, uh, because usually, you know, you're writing it in splashes of time rather than in long stretches. Uh, and because the, the, because poetry is not something you sit down and know in, in advance what you're going to do. I'm not saying prose is, but you have to know a little bit more about what you're going to do when you sit down to continue a memoir. I always just am led by whatever, whatever comes when I'm writing a poem. So I would say that it's very, you can't really do them both at once, but you can do them alternately and that they're very di different experiences in consciousness, writing poetry and writing prose. Although Michael Andachi says they're exactly the same. So don't listen to me. <laughs> he said, I, when, I, when I first wanted to write the prose book, he said, I said, well, how do you do it? Because he started out as a poet. And he said, oh, you know, you do it just like you write a poem. And I, I knew that couldn't be right, you know, and, but he feels that way. Jennifer, would you mind if I kind of ask a follow-up question? Because Carolyn, I, I was at a uh, craft talk you gave at the Dodge Poetry Festival earlier, uh, well, I guess late last oh, year. Oh, and, uh, yeah. yeah, it was wonderful. And uh, I, I wrote down something that you said during that uh, talk that um, I, I think of often and just the simple idea that when you write a poem, you interrogate every word. Yeah. Um, and I think um, the memoirs that I like the most are ones that feel like they've been written by poets because they have that quality. But if you're writing 300 pages, how do you interrogate every word? Well, that was what took 15 years. <laughs> I mean, I, I polish and polish and polish sentences. You don't get very far as a prose writer if you work that way. And I eventually had to, you know, had to keep going and stop polishing individual sentences. Um, I had to learn a different way of writing, you know, and that took some time. Um, because here's what happened to me. I, I love writing sentences. I can even string them together into a paragraph. I'd written prose poems, but, but a book of prose needs a structure, you know, it, and it needs many, many things that, that I wasn't prepared to do. I'd never taken any classes in writing prose memoir or fiction or anything. So, um, so it was uh, something that I started at age 53 and really didn't finish till I was about, I guess, almost 69 years old. Don't do that. You really should write a prose book faster than that. Um, but yeah, I, I know what you can't really, you can't really, um, prose is not as intratextual. The language in the prose, because there's so much more of it, you, you don't have those echoes and uh, Charles Simic used to say, uh, poetry is uh, like a um, pinball machine with metaphors instead of balls. And only the balls are far, much further apart in a prose book than they are in a poem. So poetry is kind of compressed and condensed and tight. And the prose has to have a capaciousness, you know. Well, thank you so much, Carolyn Forche, for such an excellent reading and uh, such thorough and thoughtful answers to those first questions. Uh, one request that we've been getting is for Lori Soderland to share again with us the photo that was shown in the beginning for, for those of our, those members of our audience who missed it in the beginning. I'll do that. Um, don't get me, uh... Don't encourage me too much. I'll start showing you my slideshow. It'd be like uh, showing you family home movies. <laughs> this is the scamp. It's, uh, oops, if you see that, that's actually the Erie Canal. Um, oh, wonderful. But, uh, I took thousands of pictures on this trip. It was really fun to do that, um, but that was an accident. This is what I want to show you. Um, this scamp is uh, 13 feet long, um, can be pulled with a, a Toyota, which is what I was driving at the time. Um, and I still have it parked in a barn in Vermont and um, hopefully it will feel safe to travel again, not too long from now. Do you have a picture of the inside of it? 
Um, I'll look for one while we're <laughs> while we're talking and see what I can come up with. It's tiny. I mean, the the floor inside it is about two feet by two feet, and you stand there and you turn to the bathroom, the sink, the bed. You know, it's very tiny. Okay. So while while Lori is looking for a picture of the inside and maybe a picture of her dog to show us, yeah. Yeah. Um, we had uh, a couple of people ask the same question for, for Carolyn. Um, bearing witness to trauma often means experiencing it. Could you speak about your own experience of writing about trauma and the editing, reading, and rereading of these experiences many times? How do you protect your heart while also being present as a writer? Um, that's, a, that's a four or five questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, whatever you'd like to answer out of that. A couple I, of people have, have, have given a different variation of that question. I, I waited 23 years before I started writing this book. And, and I, I had all kinds of excuses. I thought I needed more perspective. I needed time. I wanted to wait until the war was over many things, but really what it was, was I was afraid of going, you have to go through everything again when you write a memoir. You have to re-inhabit it, relive it, feel it in your senses. Everything has to come back. And that's not so easy. And I, I put off a lot of scenes. I knew I had to write them, but you know, I would postpone it, you know? And um, so, so that's why partly also why it took 15 years, besides I wrote four different versions of it, but, and only liked the last most recent one, but, um, yeah, you, you, you reinscribe your consciousness with whatever you experienced. And I was in a lot of denial when I first got back from El Salvador, I didn't think of myself as a traumatized person. I thought of Salvador as traumatized, you know, but I didn't. I almost imagined myself as some sort of somehow outside of my own experience. And I know now that that wasn't the case. I understand what happened now with hindsight. Um, and sometimes it's hard when I'm reading it and I'm sorry that I lost my place today. I, I don't usually do that. I don't know why that happened. Uh, I really kind of spaced out in the middle of the reading and so, you know, even when you read it aloud, it can be difficult, but I want to tell people that Lionel is terribly funny and there's a lot of really amusing parts of this book. He's very endearing and um, maddening. He's, you know, he was a great person to get to know and I hope I brought his character to the page in the book. I mean, it's not all, you know, one tends to read intense parts when one's giving a reading, but you know, he's hilarious. You will enjoy him if you haven't read it yet. Oh, and protect your heart. You, you can't protect your heart. <laughs> this is the thing of being human. I mean, you can, um, the best way to protect your heart is to try to think about other people, you know, and then you don't close in on yourself and, strangle your heart too much, you know? I think that's the best, but I don't think there's any protection that we're really, that I can imagine having without cutting oneself off from life. Thank you. That was a great answer. Thank you, Carolyn. And, and Lori, I think you might've found the inside to show us I did, but um, I'm going to hold you all hostage. I'll show you the pictures of the inside of the trailer after I make a comment about uh, the substance of the book. Um, I just, you know, I, I listened to Carolyn's reading and I, I, I love the memoir. It's, a, it's such a beautiful book. Um, really, if you, if you just, just as a beautiful book, it's amazing, but what it's about is so important. But what I think about is I don't, I don't want to be like alarmist. Um, it's not not what I intend, but I do need to say that there's only a few shades between sort of what we're experiencing in our own world right now and where it ends up and where it can end up. And we think we have institutions that protect us from becoming places like the El Salvador that Carolyn writes about, but what if those institutions fail? Um, so I don't say that to, to terrify us, although, you know, I reviewed a book recently about um, 
Eastern Europe and, and the sort of failing democracies of Eastern Europe and how they look to us and they see us faltering and they wonder if it's possible for anybody to succeed at this. And I just get us, it gets me thinking not about being scared about all of this, but about how important it is for us to understand who we are and what's happening and to heal these things and to fix these things somehow. Um, so I just wanted to say that because, you know, I write about our country and I can still make jokes about it, but it's seven years after that trip, it's getting a little less funny. Um, and, I, and I think we really need to to be mindful and grateful for the fact that we are not, you know, seeing bodies turning up in ditches, but it's shades, you know, it's degrees of this. So anyhow, having said that, I'm gonna share my screen and show you some pictures of the cool little trailer that I encourage all of you to get so that you can all go off on journeys of your own. Uh, this is a scamp, here it comes. Um, this, is, this is the side view. And I'm gonna scroll through here. There's the door going into the inside. There's the <gasps> kitchen. <laughs> wow. Uh, this is kind of hard to see, but it's, it's a bed that you take those cushions off it and it becomes a table with two benches. And those, you turn in the other direction, there's a bathroom and some storage. This is the shower curtain. So you stand in your bathroom and you can shower and there's a toilet in there. So the door is to the right, then there's this bathroom and to the left would be the sink and standing right be or from where I'm standing to take this picture right behind me is the bed. It is tiny and it's really all you need. Mm -hmm. There's a bathroom, very nice. I found it very difficult to use a bathroom in such a small space. It's like, it felt like, you know, using the bathroom in your own kitchen. This is my dog. We are, we are attempting to pack for the journey, having a hard time deciding what to bring. That was the stuff. <laughs> There's the back of the car. There it is full. Wow. And there we go, ready to go. That's Colby. Colby was 14 when we set off on this adventure and lived almost another two years after this. Wow. Um, there we are at uh, getting, like the day I left, my trailer lights didn't work. So I had to go back to U-Haul and the guy fixed it. Uh, but anyhow, that's the scamp. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing all those photos with us. And thank you also for the comment you made before you shared those photos. That takes us into um, two questions that we received in the chat. Um, uh, one of them was for, both of them were for Carolyn and they are, uh, has recent US history inspired you to write anything? Uh, and the second one is, do you believe the present American education system does enough to bridge the facts of history with the emotion of literature? How can foreign language study be included in this bridge? Um, okay, what I'm doing uh, is last summer, I worked with some other writers uh, to start an organization. It was called Writers Against Trump, Watt, we called it. And we've been meeting constantly. And we did, it, we did a lot of um, Zoom uh, national meetings on various, on the swing states and finally on the Georgia runoffs. And it was really, we decided to keep going because we realized of course how precarious our democracy had become and still is. And that we changed our name to Writers for Democratic Action. Writersfordemocraticaction.org. I invite all of you to join us. We have almost 2000 members now in the United States and abroad because of course the issue of supporting democracy is international and democracy is precarious everywhere now. Um, so I, and I also would say that to know how democracy was saved this time in the United States, there's an article coming out in the February 15th issue of, of all things, Time Magazine that runs down the whole history of how the groups began to work to save our democratic institutions in 2018 and began to, and how people foresaw what might happen with the elections and in the elections aftermath. So I really encourage you to try to find that article because it will inspire you to realize how much, how many people worked all over this country on the ground to, uh, to, to keep our republic. Um, 
I, I, I believe in those people and I believe in this work. I haven't written anything except statements for the website we have at Writers for um, Democratic Action. Um, in terms of education, we have gutted education in this country and education is the answer to all of it. Um, and I don't know how we're going to turn that around, uh, but charter schools is certainly not an answer. Uh, we have stopped teaching se uh, second languages and third languages. We have stopped teaching what they call foreign languages, even in higher education. And as anyone who speaks another language, even in the terrible way I do, it does change your consciousness. You do almost become another person when you enter another language because language structures our consciousness in, in a very interesting way. So I believe in the study of, of languages, even if you can't master, even if you're not fluent, you know, try. And, um, and we have to work very hard to improve our education system at, from K through university. And universities should be as they are in most of Europe, free. So we have to turn away from the um, vast expenditure for arms. We have the um, largest military in the, in the world. We spend more on the military than the rest of the world combined. We need to devote more of our resources to the common good, you know, and to our people. So I, I could talk about this all night and I won't, but <laughs> Please join Writers for Democratic Action. That we, you're most we put, welcome. We put it in the chat so everyone. Good. Okay. Can see it. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. We have a question for Lori about the process um, of writing um, this memoir. This is your second memoir, and um, if you could talk to us, especially the writers in the room um, who are memoirists, if you could speak a little bit about your process for this. And we've heard Carolyn talk about how this was the several versions of this book um, of her memoir. Did, did you have a similar experience where you had several versions of this um, and whatever you could teach, teach us in a few minutes about, about that process? Well, I'm gonna hope that um, some nugget of wisdom will channel through me and I'll try to not uh, say everything I know because that won't help. I'll say something I know, right? Um, uh, my process is so messy. I'm a writer who needs to write about 10,000 words to get to the thousand I should keep. And I'm trying to get better about that as I get older and wiser and partly it's confidence. I have a little more confidence at the page now. Um, the process of writing this particular book, I was interested in the subject of all of these um, places. You know, I, my, my mom's from Wisconsin, my dad's from Montana. I've driven around the country a lot. Um, I was just so interested in the places, but that doesn't make a book. You know, that makes a sabbatical adventure, which I took, you know, I took an adventure on my sabbatical. But how do you turn that into um, a coherent book, a cohesive, but coherent like and and the, the answer to that is there has to be a narrative through line and there's a narrative through line in the creation of the United States of America but it's not creative nonfiction it's that's history how do you make a creative nonfiction through line upon which like a spine you get to hang all of the stuff about the Erie Canal and and Cleveland and Paducah and Hannibal Missouri and West Virginia I love West Virginia I love Kentucky how, how do you do that? Um, for me, just my answer and my style of writing, because you know you have only so much time in a life, you develop a style that works for you and, and go with it, right? My style is, uh, I have to have a personal narrative at the center of it. And it ended up being the story of a breakup of a, of a long relationship. Did I want that to be the story that I wrote about? Not necessarily, but it was the story that was true at the time of that traveling and and it was a meta you know it was all metaphorical it worked together i see disintegration and collapse in the country and i'm experiencing disintegration and collapse in myself so hoping for to channel a nugget for you my process is whatever it is that i'm interested in i have to find a personal connection to it i have to find the narrative spine and once i'm willing to explore that own piece of my own life 
in a way. It gives me just a spine to hang on all the stuff. I like to be outward looking, but if you don't, if you're not willing to make yourself vulnerable and tell a personal story, and, and at least in the kind of writing I do, you won't end up with a book or even an essay. Thank you, Lori. That was really helpful answer to, especially to our um, memoir and nonfiction students in the audience. Hope so. We appreciate that. We keep getting so many great questions in the chat. And unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna be able to get to all of them. So if we don't get to your question, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but one question for, for both authors um, is, how do you decide what not to write? What part of the truth to hold back in silence? Lori. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me go ahead on that one, Carolyn, and then that. <laughs> Time to come up with uh, the brilliant true answer. I'll come up with the <laughs> quick, easy answer. <laughs> um, what not to write? Listen, I I, uh, I came to writing through journalism. Um, they tell you 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 can write this much, and you know this much, you know. Uh, so you're always you know writing short is hard. Um, but to me, the answer is um, once I discover what the through line is. I can really only include the things that um, connect to that main story. Um, and and the, the hard thing is you don't want what you leave out to mean you have somehow not told the truth. You know, you, 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 need, to, you need to tell the truth about whatever you're writing about. Um, and if you leave parts out, sometimes something really important is missing. So that's tricky. There's no easy answer to any of this, but I do think it has to, I leave out anything that doesn't connect to that main idea that I've I've got. But but my you know my my objective as a writer is really to to tell a story. And I I, I know from reading Carolyn's memoir, I'm, I'm sure her answer will be a little different because she had material that needed to be shared with you. You know, like she she went and saw something that she needed to tell you all about. Um, so I wonder how she would answer the question. Um, about silence, um, silence is very powerful. I have the same impulse as you. I, I felt that I had, I had what, a, what I was writing from memory and it felt like a thousand jigsaw puzzle pieces. Only none of them had a picture on it and I had to fit them together. You know, I had to figure out which pieces am I going to use? Which of all the things that happened can be in this book? I knew it couldn't go over a hundred thousand words but it was many, many, many things so I had to figure out what needs to be a scene and what can just be a sentence and what can be where I stop speaking and let the silence speak for the rest of it, you know, and not try to keep elaborating. And, and I, um, I, I had to do it intuitively and I threw away the little jigsaw pieces that didn't contribute to the picture, the things that really weren't doing any work, you know, especially self-indulgent things. I, I decided to not to have in this memoir that I would never let the reader know more than I knew at the time. And I wouldn't flip into the present and say what I now think about that past. I would make my present self be quiet and just let the past speak for itself. And you make decisions like that and it helps a great deal. You, you, know, you don't feel that you're leaving out truth but you are leaving out some details or events or scenes because maybe another scene conveys that better or, you know, or maybe it doesn't work with the through line as Lori said. So for me, it's an intuitive process because I, I, I wasn't writing it very systematically, which is why it took 15 years. I think I could benefit from taking some classes. <laughs> It is really so hard to know things that you can't tell because you only have a certain amount of space. And I think that's true for everybody. Like we all know things that we want to share with the world and we're lucky to be able to share some, right? Very, yeah. I, I would say that what Margaret Atwood told me was that just get it on paper. Don't worry about whether it's going to be the first chapter is still the first chapter or whatever, get a lot of stuff on paper and then see what you have and then write your book. Mm. So the first draft is getting it all on paper and then 
looking to see what's there. And maybe that, that was a good idea, especially for a poet who's going to sit and polish phrases all day. You know? <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, it looks like we've, we've got time for one more question uh, for, for, for each author. Uh, so for Lori, um, is there anything going on now that you are writing about? Well, going by going on, I expect that um, the question is um, what's going on in our country right now? And is that inspiring me to continue to write about what I'm writing about? And um, I have to say that uh, to write about this seven years ago and to see what has happened since has been um, really emotionally difficult for me in certain ways. And I'm glad that my book exists. I don't think I could write it now. It would be a different book. And I, I mean, it, it, it it shows what was happening that we weren't seeing until now we see it. Um, and I think the book is still very relevant, but um, I don't think I could write about that now. So I've turned my attention entirely elsewhere and I am writing about renovating an old barn in Vermont. But again, it's going to be, um, it's going to be a metaphor for, you know, like it's, it's, it's a, a central image around which um, I, I see so many things and the idea, maybe having written a book about everything falling apart, I want to write a book about um, reconstructing, rebuilding, healing, um, fixing, um, hoping. So that's where I'm headed. And maybe hopefully seven years from now, we'll say, oh, look, so she was seeing hope when we needed hope. You know, like, like let's hope that that's what's happening. Um, thank you so much, Lori. And I have one more question for Carolyn because the, there are a lot of poetry students in the audience here today um, from the Hudson Valley Writers Center from Manhattanville. Um, so they would, be upset if I if I didn't ask you quickly about poetry. Again, this is this is Carolyn's new book of poetry, and it came out at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, this book and Jane Hirschfeld's book of poetry are the, the first two books I read during the quarantine. Um, so um, of course we're all reading um, Carolyn's poetry as well at this time. And I'm just wondering, Carolyn, if you have any um, nuggets of, of craft to, to share with the emerging poets who the student poets who are here in the audience today? Oh my, um, it, it sounds like a question about advice. I would say um, the, the thing that helped me was to read everything I could get my hands on and read the poetry aloud, read other people's poetry aloud to myself, uh, not only from the present, but from the past and put the music in my mind and, uh, and, then, um, and then follow your own consciousness and intuition and um, be brave, you know. Um, your, you know, things like your, how long your lines are and what your music sounds like. And don't worry about your subject matter. The, the language will carry you. Don't worry about what you're writing about. Don't force anything. Let the subject matter arise from your deepest obsessions within you. And I, I tell my students sometimes, if you don't like your deepest obsessions, you could change those, you know, and then, and then you'll write from a different set of deepest obsessions. I just want to say I've, how much I've enjoyed this with Lori and with all of you. And, you know, someday I'd love to see the Hudson Valley again. And I wish you luck with the restoration of your barn. And uh, thank you all for being here. It's lovely. Uh, it's a lovely thing to do on, on the national weird holiday they do tonight with this. <laughs> oh, but but um, our wonderful poet is reading again tonight in the Super Bowl halftime. And that's what I want to watch. I want to watch Miss yeah. Gorman give us another poem. Isn't that a beautiful, see there's, uh, yeah. Carolyn, there's evidence that we are evolving and we can change. We put a poet in the middle of the football thing. Yeah. I mean, isn't that awesome? That's beautiful. And, and I want to say thank you all as well. And Carolyn, it has really been a really great honor to read with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And thank you, Sophia. It's so wonderful to, to do these readings with you now. It, it makes all the difference in the world. And what a wonderful audience you've been. 
Um, of course, we've taped this, as you can see, so it will be on our website soon. We really appreciate all of you being here today. Oh, and we also, hope the link to the Time Magazine article I talked about, the link is on the chat. The link is on the chat, and yeah. we're going to send the chat to, we're saving the chat, and we're going to send it to Carolyn and Lori, mm -hmm. so, um, so you can read what everyone has written about you, and all of the thanks and appreciation. Um, and please come back to hear on Wednesday to hear Marilyn Nelson. And don't forget to buy the books. Lori's holding up her book. Um, <laughs> and then here, here's it's out in paperback now for all of you who haven't who haven't read it in hardcover. And um, this will be out in paperback in one month if you want to buy paper instead. It's cheaper. Yes. And thank you all for being here. And we hope to see you again very soon. Please stay safe. Wear your masks. And thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Lori. It was amazing. Thank you, Jennifer. Really. Bye. Bye-bye.